Good afternoon, conference. Please join me in welcoming the President of the Liberal Democrats, Baroness Sal Brinton. Thank you, conference. Um, I love the next item on the agenda when we mark the extra special contribution of some of our wonderful members. And just to say that this year, the Dadabai Naroji and the Penhaligon Awards are not being awarded, so watch out for next year. But to this afternoon's special awards. The first of this year's awards is the Liberal Democrat Women Award in memory of Patsy Colton, who was an outstanding Lib Dem MP for Cheadle and a role model for so many of us women in the party. Now, this year's winner has been a party activist, a parliamentary candidate, and a member of a number of party bodies, including Lib Dem women. She has achieved what few individuals can. She challenged UK government policy in relation to tax through her speeches and work in the Liberal Democrats. At one conference, she spoke about the potential to lift ordinary men and women out of poverty by changing the income tax threshold, persuading conference to make it party policy, and it was also in our 2010 manifesto. Now, those of you with long memories will remember that David Cameron famously mocked the policy until, in coalition, the idea was taken up through meetings with Conservative ministers who eventually agreed to make the change. Now, this policy change for ordinary people, particularly low-paid women, has been an amazing and effective way to help families and part-time workers and low-paid workers. So, for her outstanding contribution, this year's winner of the Patsy Colton Award is made to the amazing Lizzie Jukes. Now we turn to the President's Award. And this award is to recognize members who've been elected to some public office and have demonstrated excellent service to the party well above and beyond the call of duty. Now the winner of this year's President's Award spearheaded the fight for equality for over 50 years and was one of the first people to publicly advocate for legalizing same-sex marriage and in 1979 led the commitment for the Liberal Manifesto for Gay Rights. He set up, you're working out who it is, he set up and ran one of the first helplines to support gay men, which now runs as an LGBT support center in Leicester today, and he has been involved for most of the remaining decades of work with that. But more than that, he was the first openly gay man to hold national office in a UK political party. He was a political advisor to Robert McClelland MP and vice chairman of the Young Liberals League. And his influence and example were the most important reasons why the Young Liberals and the Liberal Party accepted the reality of openly gay lifestyles in normal social and political settings, which, by the way, probably included the first men dancing with men at discos in the 70s. This was truly groundbreaking. Many, many liberals look to this year's winner as a fount of knowledge in the fight for LGBT rights, and he serves as honorary patron of LGBTQ+. The party is immensely grateful for the important work that this special man has done over the last half a century in fighting for LGBTI rights and helping others to do the same. So here to receive his award, 
please welcome to the stage the very special and wonderful Bernard Greaves. I always find this terribly emotional. <clears throat> Next, we have the Harriet Smith Award. Now, this award was created in remembrance of an outstanding member of the party who had never been elected to public office. And this year, the winner of the Harriet Smith Award is a nationally recognized businessman and entrepreneur, and I have to say was nominated by many, many people for his tireless work against fighting racism. He reaches out to diverse communities that are underrepresented and has successfully launched a Black History Month campaign that went viral in the party, passed diversity conference motions, and transformed our party's approach to race equality. Now, described by those who nominated him as a man of integrity and candor who works very hard. I'm terribly sorry, I think that's an understatement. I just don't know when he stops. He is a man with infectious passion, a role model for members of color, and particularly for future MPs. One person described how he is helping others flourish and find their path in the party as a black, Asian, and minority ethnic person. Our winner is the chair of Lib Dem Campaign for Race Equality. Please welcome to the stage, Roderick Lynch. <laughs> Now for the Belinda Airbrook Award, which is awarded to recognize the efforts of our staff working for our elected representatives in their local areas. Now, this award winner joined the party in 2012 as an intern, was promoted to organizer in North Devon and then North London, and then became the campaign manager for Twickenham, Richmond Park, and North Kingston. During this time, our winner has achieved incredible results in the 2018 local election victory that saw Richmond Borough go from 14 to 39 councillors, and she was agent to all Lib Dem candidates in that election. And just in case you thought that wasn't enough, in the elections a year ago, our winner was at the same time elected into the seat that was known as the safest Tory seat in the borough. Not resting on their laurels after 2018, this year she returned to North Devon to help former colleagues with their campaign, which resulted in more Lib Dems on North Devon Council and taking the council to no overall control, as well as to increasing the Lib Dem vote percentage in a by-election in East Sheen in Richmond in London, helping deliver one of the highest Lib Dem votes across the country, which helped us secure three outstanding members of the European Parliament in the London region. Now, as a councillor, she has been instrumental in the year that she's been a councillor in getting the council to adopt a new anti-domestic violence policy that was cited as good practice by our Home Affairs team in the House of Lords. Our winner was described by those who nominated her as an inspirational team builder who just empowers colleagues. It is my immense pleasure to welcome to the stage Alice Bridges Westcott. <laughs> Alice, come up.
there are so many people, in addition to our hardworking members and activists who've received awards today, who deserve our thanks for putting on such a fantastic conference. Yet again, we've seen the highest number of members attending conference for the first time, 900. So from all of us here, a huge thank you to all the staff here at the Bournemouth International Centre and the Marriott Highcliffe Hotel who've hosted conference, exhibition, fringe, and I think perhaps most importantly, the conference bar. Thank you. A special thank you for your generous donations to the Bournemouth Food Bank for their fantastic work in the community and the support that they give to local families in crisis. Please applaud yourselves. Thank you also to the team at Business Events Bournemouth for their support in the run-up and during the event. And as always, we are supported by fantastic suppliers who care about the success of our conference as much as we do. Chris Dan and the crew at Quirk, they make this fantastic stage set and always go above and beyond the call of duty. And the team at Aztec, who not only keep our HQ teams online, up and running, but also our fringe events running smoothly, as well as Nouradine al excuse me, I'm, whew, no, beg your pardon, Nouradine, Nouradine al and Darren Bridock, who've done an enormous amount in the background too. So Sean Beavers and his hardworking team at Ford and Bailey, who helped deliver such a successful exhibition. And special thanks, as always, to the fabulous Claire Edwards, Harjit Jagdev, and Peter Shilston, our British Sign Language interpreters, who have really become part of the Lib Dem family. Many thanks to John Russell, who is our long-standing official party photographer. And we are supported throughout by SPA Security, who ensure that we run a safe and secure conference and who, as always, have shown great humor and professionalism all week. Now, this conference wouldn't happen without the ongoing support from all our sponsors, exhibitors, advertisers, and fringe bookers. They are so important to us, and we look forward to working with them again next year. Thank you. And I want to give a big thank you, too, to the Federal Conference Committee, the Federal Policy Committee, to the utterly amazing stewarding team under the leadership of Mike Ross and Jodie Frapple. Thank you. And to the parliamentary staff, the WHIPS office, and all those working across our party, from local party organizers to regional and state party staff, who may be invisible to you, but we know the work they do. Thank you. And that also goes for the HQ teams who work behind the scenes to deliver press, policy, operations, international visitors, training programs, and so much more. Thank you all too. And whilst last, definitely not least, the conference office itself, led by Susie Murray, Diva Bozzoni, Wilma Robinson, and Hannah Bacchus, and their fantastic team of volunteers, including Tom Beerman, who have all worked so hard over the last few months to deliver Another fantastic event for us, but most of them are new to the party, and I think they've done a brilliant job. Thank you. <laughs> just before I hand over to Mike German, I just want to say a brief word about welcoming Jo Swinson to her first conference leader's speech. Now, I've known Jo for many years, from being target seat candidates together in the run-up to 20, uh, 2005, 
We've worked together to improve the diversity of the party over the years, and I have just watched her grow in confidence from when she was baby of the house in 2005, developing into a respected business minister, and now, within two months of becoming our leader, she is not just transforming the party, she's transforming the country. Jo, as I leave the stage as party president, I know we are going to scale heights unknown under your leadership, and we are all with you. So now, let me hand over to Mike German, who may want to talk to you a bit about money. I thank you all. Well, there you are. That's the theme of the next few minutes. And for those of you who are new to conference, if there's 900 of you, I'm so pleased, by the way, that there are newbies here in the posh seats in the front row. There's so many of them. And they'll soon know what we've got to do next. I want you to believe. I want you to be confident. I want you to be e extremely careful about what I say now. Because we are faced with extraordinary times. These political times are more extraordinary than any I have known in my political lifetime. And with extraordinary times has come extraordinary opportunity. And you know what I mean. It's about winning more seats than we've ever won before. That's your challenge, to win more seats. We know we can, we can do it. We all think we can do it. I want you to believe that you can do it without a shade of doubt in your mind. But to do that, we must have the resource to make it happen. Now, normally, I would be asking you in the normal way, very gently, very calmly, without any dispassion, of just asking you, thank you very much. I'd be expecting you to empty your pockets for the party's future. But this time, it's different, very different, because we need to raise... I know for every pound that you give me today, I can get three times that amount from our membership, because our members triple it. That's been the pattern for the last four or five years, so we can do it today. So today, I want to launch the £100,000 challenge. I want to raise £100,000 in the next hour or two, and I want to raise 25000 from you so that I can triple it. And every single member of this party is going to get an email which will say you... So we're going to give them bucket of time for a little, more, little bit longer. But whilst the buckets are about to go out, just let me say to you, on the backs of the daily notices, there's how you can give your money, in precisely five minutes' time, you will be receiving an email from me which, which allows you to vote, uh, to, to press the button saying the £1,000 button or the £500 button. I, I, no, seriously, seriously, if you want to give me 25000 it would be really helpful if there were 25 people who could just say, I'll give you a pound. Oh, no, let's say one person gives me 25, then we can double it again. We can go for 200000 Ambition is what we want, confidence and belief. So in order to do that, I do require you to give lots of money in whatever way you want. But if you feel that you just can't find the, 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 the checkbook, the credit card, or any other method, just write your name and address and say, I promise I'll give you this amount of money. We know where you live. We'll find you. <laughs> we may even know your bank account details. But never mind. Uh, thank you very much for that. So the buckets are released. Out they go. Now I want to demonstrate for you while you're searching in your pockets why we need so much money. I want to introduce you to our candidate who is going to win in Isha and Walter. Our candidate against Dominic Raab, Monica Hardy. So, Monica, 
Monica, you're now a target seat for the Liberal Democrats. How does that feel to you? Well, what a difference a year makes. I'm a working mum of four children, and this was never in my game plan. <laughs> and, but the time for me to stop shouting at the television and rolling my eyes happened a year ago when I was selected to fight this seat against John Mitchell. And people said to me, you're crazy. This guy's got a majority of 25,000. It's one of the safest conservative seats in the country. What are you doing? But you know, I believe... Crash and the opportunities that I enjoy be taken away from my children. And Dominic Raab didn't represent me, and he doesn't represent the constituents of Isha and Walton that voted 60% to remain. So, what's happened in your constituency that's changed the minds of everybody there that they're going to vote and they're going to get a Liberal Democrat change? Okay, so in a year, in the local elections, the Tory vote share declined by almost 20%. How much? 20%. Oh, right, 20%. Okay. 20%. So the next thing, the European elections, we smashed it. We won by 39% in Eastern Water.
the side seat and doing what is right for our holidays. And the Conservatives are risking a calamitous Brexit that would destroy jobs and businesses. Taking on the two old tired parties of Labour and the Conservatives is the job for a party with a new kind of leader. And that is the Liberal Democrats and our fantastic new leader, Jo Swinson. In the last few months, 40,000 people have joined the Liberal Democrats. I am proud to lead the biggest, strongest Remain party in the UK. If you think our country is headed in the wrong direction and you want to change things, you can. Shouting at the television is not enough. Do something positive. Join the Liberal Democrats today and let's do this together. It's hard to believe. The fresh and energetic force, the change our country needs. Our leader, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, Joe Swenson. I have no idea how amazing you look, conference. 21 years on from my first Liberal Democrat conference, I am thrilled to stand before you today as your leader. And I'm delighted to see so many old friends who've kept the torch of liberalism burning bright through troubled times. And I'm excited to welcome thousands of new members to our cause flocking to the Liberal Democrats as the clear rallying point for a movement to create an open, fair, inclusive society. Over the summer, we showed the others how it's done. We had an energetic and positive leadership contest where many thousands of you engaged. And I want to say a huge thank you to my friend, Ed Davey. you are a brilliant campaigner with a superb record of action as Climate Change Secretary of State. And I'm delighted that there's also a promise of more with you in the key roles of Shadow Chancellor and now Deputy Leader. <laughs> Just six months ago at our spring conference, Few of us would have predicted that our party would be winning on this scale. And for that, we have my two most immediate predecessors to thank. Tim, who in the days after the European referendum, knew that our natural place as a party was to unashamedly make the case for Britain to stay in the European Union. Tim, you were absolutely right. And Vince, you have served our party and our country with such great distinction. You have so valiantly led the fight to stop Brexit and helped our party soar to new heights. And I know that the next parliament will be all the poorer without you by our side. The voice of reason in these unreasonable times. Vince, from all of us, thank you.
last autumn conference, I remember standing at the side of the conference hall next to our dear friend Paddy. He was upbeat, energetic as ever, and as we listened to the debate, he leaned over and whispered that we needed to talk about the future of the party. We agreed to have coffee. I wish we had been able to. I wish I could pick up the phone to ask his advice. I wish he could see our party now. He'd have been in his element. And as I sat last week at his memorial service with thousands of others, we remembered a man who was bold, fearless, determined. A man who brought people together. He worked closely with Labour Prime Minister Tony Blair. His eulogy was read by former Conservative Prime Minister John Major. A man whose impatience to create change was undimmed into his 70s, setting up More United to make space for liberal values to flourish beyond party lines. Paddy, we miss you so much. And I looked around and marvelled at Westminster Abbey itself. The sheer magnificence of scale, the intricate stonework and the colourful beauty of the stained glass. A spirit lifting place. And I reflected. Before a single stone was laid, someone imagined what was possible. It stands today as a physical embodiment of what greatness can be achieved when we raise our sights and come together with a shared vision. That spirit of ambition and shared endeavour is what our politics and our country needs right now. Bold, fearless, determined, and what a start we have made. I can't be the only one losing count of our many newly elected representatives. Beatrice Wishart, our new MSP for Shetland. The first ever woman elected to Parliament from the Northern Isles. Our own fabulous squad of 16 MEPs. Seven new MPs, Chuka, Jane, Sarah, Philip, Luciana, Angela and Sam. More than 700 extra councillors. And tens of thousands of new members since we last met. Can everyone who is a new member please stand up or put your hand up right now? Welcome. We all say welcome and thank you. Because together we are building something special. So let's keep going and let's keep growing. The tired old parties have failed, looking inward at a time of national crisis. Our country needs us at this precarious time. We don't have 10 or 15 years. We need to seize the opportunity now. So let me be clear.
Let me be clear, there is no limit to my ambition for our party and our country. And today I am standing here as your candidate for Prime Minister. deserve a better choice than an entitled Etonian or a 1970s socialist. Because it is only by having the Liberal Democrats in power that we can build a better future. Because we owe it to the next generation, like Olivia. 14 years old, she wrote to me after I became leader. She told me what she's doing to help stop Brexit. She signed up to be a Lib Dem supporter. In good company, like 20,000 others. She's joined gatherings in Liverpool, proudly wearing her pro-European badge. And she's even travelled to London to go on a People's Vote march. She wrote to me about how Brexit takes away her rights. How she was never asked to leave the EU. Young people like Olivia are being stripped of the opportunities that our generations have enjoyed. And how powerless they feel as they watch politicians gamble with their lives. Girls like Olivia, boys like my own two, Andrew and Gabriel. People often say to me, how do you do this with two young children? And of course it's hard. Parenting is never easy. But they are why I'm standing here. If I can do something to change the future, how could I not do this? It's why I came back two and a half years ago in despair at where our country was heading. When Theresa May called that general election, I knew in a heartbeat that I had to stand and win Eastern Bartonshire again. There is too much at stake. And I knew that even if there was only the smallest chance that we could change the direction our country had taken, I had to do everything I could to make that happen. So that's why I am here today. And that's why you are here too. Ahead of us, we have the fight of our lives for the heart and soul of Britain. Because, conference, the next few weeks are about deciding the kind of country that we are, who we want to be. Whether we tackle our biggest challenges with our closest allies or on our own. Whether we welcome those who want to build a better life in our country or shut the door on them. Whether we ensure that every single child can go on to fulfill their dreams. The first task is clear. We must stop Brexit. And we are crystal clear. A Liberal Democrat majority government will revoke Article 50 on day one. Because there is no Brexit that will be good for our country. Europe makes our United Kingdom stronger, but Brexit hurts our family of nations. For so many, the 2016 referendum ushered in a new kind of politics, driven by hate, fear, and division. But for those of us who had lived through 
the 2014 independence referendum, it all felt too familiar. I am Scottish. I am British. I am European. Scottish nationalism and English nationalism would both have me choose. But there is no contradiction. I'm a proud Scot. I love our United Kingdom and I feel stronger as part of the European family. And I want to speak directly to people in Scotland. We together voted overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union. And together we can stop Brexit. We are building a movement across the United Kingdom that is on the verge of stopping it. And you have a part to play in growing and strengthening this winning campaign across the UK. Join us. Come with me and be part of the bigger movement for change. A big vote for the Liberal Democrats in Scotland at the next general election will give us the final push we need. The energy is with us, so come with us to stop Brexit. <laughs> Last month, I visited the border in Northern Ireland, something Boris Johnson still hasn't bothered to do. Those communities remember what it was like to have a hard border. The man who told me about being detained at a checkpoint for 90 minutes with his wife and new baby just because he came from the wrong part of town. And despite vague words about unspecified technological solutions, the people there know that even the lightest equipment at the border will become a target and it will require security. They fear that what is currently just a line on the map will once again become a hard border. And perhaps even more importantly, a dividing line in the mind. A return to the psychology of us and them instead of everyone living together, British and Irish identities mixing invisibly. Our family of nations, Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, we are at our best together, looking out at the world, not shutting it out. It is the Liberal Democrats who will fight to keep our United Kingdom together. Brexit will put lives at risk. In the event of a no deal Brexit, doctors are worried about the impact that border delays will have on the supply of time sensitive radio pharmaceuticals. That's cancer patients waiting longer for scans and treatments as a direct consequence of government policy. Brexit will hurt our economy Thousands of car manufacturing jobs already lost. Honda in Swindon, Jaguar Land Rover in Birmingham, Ford in Bridge End, Nissan in Sunderland, and more if we leave. This Brexiteer government wants to pay for their ideology with other people's jobs. The truth is, they won't be affected and they won't be there to help when the redundancy notices are handed out. They won't be there when the homes are repossessed or when the marriages break down under financial stress, which makes what Boris Johnson is doing quite so sickening because he knows all of this. We know he knows all of this because Operation Yellowhammer 
The government's no deal planning tells us how bad it's going to be. But the truth is, you can't plan for no deal. Planning for no deal is like planning to burn your house down. You might have insurance, but you're still going to lose all your stuff. But Boris has set himself on this course. He claims he can negotiate a Brexit deal in a month. I wouldn't hold out much hope. Yesterday, he failed to negotiate where to have a press conference. We all know that commitment has never been Boris Johnson's strong suit. <laughs> but it's clear he's determined when it comes to crashing us out without a deal. Just look at what he's done over the last few weeks. He prorogued Parliament to try to prevent MPs stopping a no-deal Brexit. He's kicked 21 MPs out of the Conservative Party, including the father of the House, Ken Clark, and Churchill's grandson, Nicholas Soames, just because they dared to stand up to him. There is even now the suggestion that he would break the law and refuse to ask for an extension of Article 50. Silencing critics, purging opponents, ignoring the law. For someone who proclaims to hate socialist dictators, he's doing a pretty good impression of one. Johnson's insults of choice are rather revealing. Big girl's blouse. Girly swat. But let me tell you, conference, if he thinks being a woman is somehow a weakness, he's about to find out it is not. <laughs> When the general election comes, I cannot wait to take on the collective forces of nationalism and populism that will be standing on that debate stage. Johnson, Farage and Corbyn. If he had campaigned to remain in 2016 with half of the energy he put into the 2017 election, we may have seen a different result. Then, the day after the referendum, he said we should trigger Article 50 immediately. He whipped his MPs to vote for it. And even now, when faced with all the clear and obvious dangers that Brexit brings, Jeremy Corbyn still insists that if Labour win a general election, they will negotiate their own Brexit deal to take us out of the EU. Nigel Farage might be Brexit by name, but it is very clear that Jeremy Corbyn is Brexit by nature. <laughs> my dad was a huge influence on my life. He encouraged me to believe that we can change things for the better. He encouraged me to challenge the way things are. And above all, he taught me always to keep learning, to be curious, to ask questions. And actually, that's what any good liberal does. Because we can't make progress 
if we aren't prepared to question the world around us, to challenge vested interests and concentrations of power, to imagine that a different world is possible. And that's how the liberal tradition has always been a breeding ground for new ideas. It was Gladstone's minister, W.E. Forster, who asked why any child should miss out on education and made parents send their children to school. It was David Lloyd George who asked why the most vulnerable in society are left to fend for themselves. And he paved the way for the welfare state. It was Beveridge who asked why anyone should have to pay for health care and masterminded our beloved NHS. And it was Paddy Ashdown who asked whether it's inevitable that modern economies destroy the natural environment and put the Liberal Democrats at the forefront of green thinking. Liberal Democrats, we come from a long line of innovators. So when we were in government, we asked why any child should go hungry at school, and we introduced free school meals universally. We asked why babies should only have one parent take care of them in their first year of life, and we designed shared parental leave. And we asked why the state should judge what kind of love is acceptable, and we made same-sex marriage legal because love is love. <laughs> now we need to do it again, because our country needs us. The world around us is changing fast, and we need to be bold, unconstrained by conventional wisdom. And my first question is this. Why is our success as a country reduced to a GDP figure? We have been conditioned to believe that as long as GDP keeps growing, everything is fine. But this ignores the reality behind the numbers. That the social contract is broken that working hard and playing by the rules is no longer enough to guarantee a better life. That our planet is at breaking point. GDP measures how often we replace our clothes, our cars and our computers. How many young offenders institutions we build for children without hope. How much diesel pollutes our air and damages our lungs. When it comes to GDP, Bobby Kennedy was spot on. 50 years ago. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. That's why a Liberal Democrat government will put the well-being of people and our planet at the heart of what we do. And this autumn, we will set out our own well-being budget. Others around the world are doing this already. Take Jacinda Ardern. Thanks to her, the New Zealand government set out the world's first well-being budget. I want the UK to follow that example. I want us to fundamentally rethink the purpose of our economy so that it works for people and our planet. Our well-being budget will spell out our priorities for public spending on the things that matter most, both right now and for future generations. And my well-being ambition extends well beyond government spending. The whole of our society, including business, should work towards building the kind of country we want. People and our planet will thrive with the Liberal Democrats in power. <laughs> and 
conference, how can we look our children in the eye if we don't act now to tackle the climate crisis? We are the last generation that can stop irreversible damage to our environment. Earlier this year, Parliament declared a climate emergency. But what has the government done since then? We've set off the fire alarm and now they are just standing by watching it burn, literally. For days, we watched the Amazon, the world's lungs, just burn. While back at home, we have children whose lungs don't develop properly because of air pollution in our towns and cities. The climate emergency is an existential threat and only our party has the bold, detailed plan to tackle it. A Liberal Democrat government will plant the trees, retrofit the homes. We will build the wind turbines, the solar panels and the tidal barrages. But government alone cannot solve this. It will take all of us, government, individuals and business, to build the zero carbon UK we need to become. And that's why my Liberal Democrat government will introduce climate risk reporting and create a new green investment bank to channel investment into green projects and away from fossil fuels. And it's why I want to engage everyone in the country by establishing a UK Citizens Climate Assembly to drive a national debate about how exactly we will reach net zero by 2045 and earlier if possible. We will do it all, not because it will create thousands of good new jobs, although it will, not because it will cut energy bills, although it will, not because it will make our country a cleaner, richer, happier nation, although it will. We will do it because we have to. Because, as the placards say, there is no planet B. conference, where is our outrage when the lives of our young people are being cut so short? Earlier this year, I saw firsthand the heartbreak that follows in the wake of a fatal stabbing. Together with Pauline Pierce, I visited the beautiful shrine built for Tashawn by his family and friends after he was stabbed to death. The shrine was full of flowers, photographs, Messages, and some of his favourite things too. A skateboard, his hat, cans of his favourite fizzy drink. Tashawn was just 15 years old. And while we stood there, some of his friends came by, taking a break from their GCSE revision, grieving, mourning their friend, instead of just worrying about their exams like every other teenager. Tashon was clearly so loved. We need a public health approach to tackling the knife crime epidemic in our communities, as we've seen in Glasgow. When I was first elected back in 2005, Glasgow was the murder capital of Europe, with 39 people killed in the city that year. Around the same time, the city decided to take a public health approach to knife crime. So the Violence Reduction Unit was set up, working with schools, hospitals, and job centers to tackle violence. In effect, it meant doing more than just dealing with the physical consequences of knife crime. It means treating violent behavior as an epidemic that spreads across a community, just like we would with a disease. And the results have been spectacular since 2005 the murder rate in Glasgow has dropped by 70%. Schools, hospitals, job centres and police working together to eradicate this violence from our communities. But to win this battle, we need to invest far more in providing young people with good youth services.
Being a teenager isn't easy, and it has become a hell of a lot harder because young people have nowhere to go. They need places where not only can they hang out with their friends, but they can also get the support they need when things go wrong. That's why Liberal Democrats will give local authorities the funding they need so that they can all provide youth services and re-establish youth workers. Because every time a life like Tashon's is cut short, we are failing our young people, and it must stop now. <laughs> Conference, one of the things I'm most proud about from our time in coalition government is how we fought for better mental health services and in particular, all of the work that Norman Lamb has done over the years. <laughs> Norman's campaigning zeal and unwavering determination to put mental health on the agenda have been second to none. And I'm so glad he'll continue his work outside of Parliament because we still need to do so much more for mental health. Because, Conference, why should any child travel as much as 339 miles to get a mental health bed? That's from here to Durham. A child who is so ill that they need to be hospitalised, forced to leave family and friends behind just to get the treatment they need. Why have we, as a society, decided that this is something we can't change and that we should just accept it? A Liberal Democrat government will ring-fence funding for mental health services. And we will invest far more heavily in the childhood and adolescent mental health services that communities need. <laughs> Conference, I won't stand here and pretend I have all the answers for what happens next. There are enough new at all politicians around. <laughs> and the more I get to see of them, the more obvious it is that they actually know nothing. But this much I am sure of. The opportunity in front of us is huge. And it is for the taking. We can win. We must win. And to do so, we must build the biggest liberal movement this country has ever seen. We cannot be satisfied with a place on the fringes of British politics, narrow and pure, small and irrelevant. Our job is to gather the forces of liberalism and be the rallying point for change. We must be welcoming and inclusive, recognising the journey fellow travellers are on. Because together we can create a tipping point and transform our society. My vision for our country is one where every single person is valued and included. A country where people work hard and are rewarded with a decent home enough money to meet their needs and live with dignity, where every baby born is given the security and the love they need to face the world with confidence, where every child can play and learn about the world free from worry and stress, where every young person is nurtured and supported in the path they choose, where people work in good jobs for decent wages, in flexible ways, in a culture of mutual respect, 
where experience is shared across the generations, listening to the wisdom of years while channeling the enthusiasm of youth, where we support vulnerable people, both those people whose circumstances mean they will always be vulnerable, and every single one of us who may be vulnerable at some point, whether through illness or grief, redundancy or trauma, new parenthood or old age, where we make it easier for people to live in good health and people know that our excellent NHS is always there when they need it, where people can be themselves, respected for who they are, no matter what God they pray to or none, the color of their skin or who they love, where everyone knows they can make a contribution to society. And this is measured by creativity and compassion, laughter and love, innovation and inspiration more than by money. Where enterprise and business is celebrated because it acts as part of the solution, not part of the problem. Where we respect the natural world, this planet, our only home, and we act with the urgency required to live within our environmental means because we will not leave our children a poisoned planet. Where we love our country, our wonderful United Kingdom, our strong family of nations, Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland, who have achieved so much together and will not be ripped apart. Where we take our place in the wider world with responsibility with respect for ourselves and for other nations too. Only a Liberal Democrat government can deliver the fair, inclusive and open future that we deserve. general election, voters will choose the kind of country we want to be. Insular, closed and selfish, or collaborative, open and generous. A politics of fear, hate and division, or one of respect, hope and inclusion. Liberal Democrats, we can build the broad, open, liberal movement our country needs. We can defeat nationalism and populism. We can change our politics, stop Brexit and win a brighter future.